<laughs> so, Etienne is going to tell us today what's going on. <laughs> Thank you, Harold. So, in a nutshell, he did not prove it. <laughs> Okay, thank you for coming back. So as you see today, I want to discuss this paper of Poincaré sur les lignes géodésiques des surfaces convexes and look at the date and the place. It was published in 1905 and presented to the society at the St. Louis meeting. Uh, this is uh, one of the very few opportunities when Poincaré went abroad. So he went to America for this uh, meeting in St. Louis. You can see him on the boat. Uh, 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 on the left, you have Darboux. And on the right, you have Poincaré. And you can see below in the legend the big mistake on the name, Poincaré, with two R's. So Poincaré hated that. He hated the idea that the point might be a square. And uh, uh, <laughs> uh, he said that many times. He hated this mistake on his name. So as you probably know, this year, 1905, is very imp important in the history of science because this is the same year that uh, Einstein published his paper on, on relativity. And there was some kind of discussion whether or not Poincaré had understood relativity before or after Einstein, I don't really care. But in any case, uh, Poincaré was very close to relativity. And I want to show you a few hints that indeed he was uh, uh, very close to relativity. But before that, I want to impress you by showing you the list of publications of Poincaré in 1905. So this is. Oh, this is something else. Poincaré was so famous, so famous that his picture was on chocolate plates. <laughs> Even Cédric Villani would not be like that today. <laughs> <laughs> what? No, 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 no. His cousin, Raymond Poincaré, was also famous because he was a politician. But he, this is uh, uh, Henri Poincaré. Can recognize him. Okay, so here's the list of publications for 1905. You see that uh, he was busy with many things. Uh, he wrote uh, Science and Hypothesis, he wrote, well, uh, La Valeur de la Science, uh, and uh, do not be mistaken, this is only page one of the list of publications in 1905. So you see, he did many things at the same time. For example, you can see. Um, Sur les invariants arithmétiques, so that was really number theory. And the, the third line, sur la dynamique de l'électron, is the paper in which, according to some people, he describes relativity. And uh, this second page is only the second page, because the third page contains uh, uh, the paper in question, sur les lignes géodésiques des surfaces convexes. And you can see that he was also writing on logic at the same year. So this is very, very impressive. In order to convince you that he was really close to uh, relativity and even to general relativity, I want to mention a quote from Poincaré from this year, which is the following. This is, the, of course, the English translation. Look at that. Worlds will be indistingu indistinguishable not only if they are equal or similar, that is, if we can pass from one to the other by changing the axis of coordinates or by changing the scale to which lengths are referred, but they will still be indistinguishable if we can pass from one to the other by any point transformation, whatever. I will explain my meaning. I suppose that to each point of one corresponds one point on the other and only one, and inversely. And besides, that the coordinates of a point are continuous functions, otherwise altogether arbitrary of, of the corresponding point. I suppose, besides, 
that to each object of the first world corresponds in the second an object of the same nature placed precisely at the corresponding point. I suppose finally that this correspondence fulfilled at the initial instant is maintained indefinitely. We should have no means of distinguishing these two worlds one from the other. The relativity of space is not ordinary understood in so broad a sense. It is thus, however, that it would be proper to understand it. In other words, you can see here the assertion that the law of physics should be an invariant under the full group of diffeomorphism, of homeomorphism. This is really, uh, I think, amazing statement of, uh, of a general relativity uh, uh, in 1905. But let's go to our papers of today. Since the list of publications is so long, I cannot discuss everything. I just want to discuss this paper. The first comment I want to make, and I already made it yesterday, that you should know that Poincaré was not interested by geodesics. He was interested by a broader question, discussing dynamics, celestial mechanics, and even more general questions. And you should understand this paper as an, some kind of exercise for him, trying to put him in a situation where you can understand better, in a simpler example, a general problem. So let us have a look at the introduction. The first sentences explain very clearly that he is interested by celestial mechanics. Dans mes méthodes nouvelles de la mécanique céleste, j'ai étudié les solutions du problème des trois corps. So he says that this is celestial mechanics is very, very complicated. It's too complicated. And what he's looking for is a simpler problem for which he can say something. And he said at some moment, ce problème est tout trouvé. C'est celui des géodésiques sur une surface. So obviously from start in the introduction, he claims that he is looking at the behavior of geodesics on the, on the convex surface only as a toy model for celestial mechanics, which is indeed his most important uh, problem in his mind. So he explains why this is uh, easier. And uh, 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 so it, this is really the first sentences. And then he says, Monsieur Adamar, that we have met yesterday, understood clearly what I just said. And he looked at the geodesics of negatively curved surfaces. This is what we discussed yesterday. And then, poof, he says, that's the wrong hypothesis. Adamar solved an easy problem. I want to solve a difficult problem. I want to go to positive curvature. If you think a little bit, even today in dynamics, uh, in dynamical system, you have two kind of uh, groups which barely speak to each other. Huh? You have the people working on hyperbolic dynamical systems, adnoso flows, axiom A is partially hyperbolic, blah, blah, blah. And the other, on the other uh, direction, you have the people looking at elliptic dynamical systems coming from positive curvature. And uh, this is the distinction between Adama, you know, hyperbolic uh, axiom A, partially hyperbolic, very easy, and uh, <laughs> positive curvature, it's the real question. Hmm? And then he says, my question is much harder than the question of Hadama, and therefore I had to limit myself to some partial results, and uh, uh, I can only discuss periodic geodesics in this paper. Okay, so that's uh, what he wants to do. Now, uh, uh, I want to mention this paper by this uh, lady, Anne Robadet, who defended a PhD on history of mathematics uh, some 15 years ago. And uh, it was a very interesting uh, PhD. Uh, she was under the direction of a historian, uh, Karin, Shem Karin Shemla, and Harold was part of the uh, advisor, if I am not mistaken. She did her day uh, who? She did her day, uh, she, she, she did her day, day uh, with, uh, with Harold. And this was, uh, this, and I was the uh, referee for the, for the PhD. 
And this is a, a remarkable analysis of, the, of this paper and trying precisely to explain why uh, something that nobody had understood before, why really Poincaré did not care about geodesics. Huh? He was interested by dynamical systems. This is why what I mentioned today that uh, Hedlund claimed that Hadamard uh, did not understand geodesics from a dynamical point of view, it's completely wrong. I mean, all these people were not interested by differential geometry. They wanted to understand the dynamics of celestial mechanics. Okay, so let's have a look at the uh, uh, second uh, paragraph of this paper of Poincaré. If I have time, I will discuss the first paragraph at the end of the talk. And then he develops what he called the principe de continuité analytique. This is an idea, and maybe this is the only idea that you have to remember today. This is a very simple idea that has been instrumental in all the papers of Poincaré from 1880 to, to his death in 1912. It's a general principle of how to solve a problem. You want to solve a problem, you want to solve some existence problem, you cannot do it for the data that you have, but you can do it for a simpler problem with a simpler data. And the idea of Poincaré is that you connect the problem for which you know the solution to the problem for which you don't know the solution by some path, and you try to follow the solution by continuity. This is, uh, 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 has many names in mathematics, but Poincaré used the terminology uh, 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 analytic continuation. So let me show you the picture. So suppose you have a, on the real axis, you're from zero to one. Zero is where you understand your problem and one is when you look for a solution to your problem. And the, at time t, you have some intermediate between zero and one, and you write your, your problem as an equation. And you see that I have drawn on this picture some analytic curve in the plane, in the square. And uh, uh, this is uh, the most general analytic curve you can think of. And the observation of Poincaré, very easy, but not so easy actually, is that when you go from zero to one, and you count how many solutions you have to your problem, the parity of the number of solutions is constant. You might have, for example, an equation like that. Here are two solutions, and then these two solutions disappear. You had two, now you have one. You have, you have zero. The parity, of course, counting multiplicity, is constant. You, have might, you might have very complicated singular points, but if the situation is analytic, the parity of the number of points on the slice by t between zero and one is constant. So if you can make sure that for t is equal to zero, you have an odd number of points. This odd number will be odd for every t, and in particular will not be zero, and you can prove that you have a solution for two is e t is equal to one. So this is the general strategy. You want to solve your problem, you want to prove that above one, there is something. Instead of proving that there's only at least one solution, you prove there is an odd number of solutions. And in order to prove that there is an un, not odd number of solutions, you prove there is a, an odd number of solutions at the initial time when t is equal to zero. And since you know that parity is constant under deformation, you can make sure that at the end of the game, you, had at, you have at least one solution. Well, this is the so-called uh, uh, continuity principle. But I have to say that this is far from obvious. When I told you uh, uh, the parity is constant, how do you prove it? For example, how do you know that 
an analytic curve in the plane could be like that. Could stop. Why not? Why not? Well, you could imagine maybe an analytic curve with a, a dead end. And this is a long story. Newton said, this does not exist. No proof. Gauss, in his PhD, claimed that this is not possible. And he added a footnote. And the footnote was, uh, nobody has doubted that this is true. If somebody wants a, pro uh, uh, wants a proof, I can provide it. <laughs> and he never provided it. Then a, a mathematician called Serret provided a proof in 1850, and the proof was wrong. And another mathematician, also called Serret, I suspect of the same family, wrote a paper 10 years later proposing another proof that I believed was correct until Serge showed me that it was not correct. So as far as I know, you had to understand to get a full proof, you had to wait until the complete proof of the tweezer expansions of analytic curves. It took a long time to get the properly defined proofs. And uh, uh, actually, to the best of my knowledge, the first proof of that is, guess it, in the PhD of Poincaré. Part one of the, theme of the PhD of Poincaré contains what's called today the Weierstrass preparation theorem which implies this, uh, this, uh, 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 this fact. So the parity is indeed constant. This phenomenon is not possible for an analytic curve. However, a phenomenon that might appear is this. You might have, unlike on the picture, one of the red curves might go to infinity like an asymptote. And then you lose one of the solutions. And Poincaré knew that very well in all his papers, except in this one. It seems that he forgot this difficulty there in this paper. Uh, you will see, I will tell you that this is indeed the main difficulty in the paper of Poincaré, proving the existence of periodic geodesics. He seems to have forgotten that one of the curves could go to infinity. Now, uh, uh, this method of continuity Again, you, you keep it in mind. This is a very powerful tool for proving any kind of theorem you want. And uh, uh, he used it in many situations. Like, for example, in 1882, when he proved the uniformization theorem, any algebraic curve can be uniformized by the Poincaré disk. Uh, how do you do that? Well, he took one example for which he knows that it's true. And then he takes another curve, joins it by a, by a curve, and proves by the continuity principle that uh, uh, the end of the curve is also uniformizable. So the first proof of, uniform, of uniformization theorem has been produced using this trick. Another example is um, when Poincaré was uh, dealing with uh, astronomy or physics, he was looking at the equilibrium position of the fluid in rotation. You take a fluid. You let it rotate. So the fluid is, uh, is submitted to gravitation, is submitted to centrifugal force. And the question is, what, what are the possible positions of equilibrium? How a, a massive fluid under gravitation and, and centrifugal force can uh, uh, find its equilibrium? And Poincaré used it to prove many wonderful theorems, like incredible shapes proving that you can have very strange shapes in space, rotating at constant velocity, and having uh, uh, this equilibrium. He used it everywhere, and in particular in astronomy, and in his uh, 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 book on uh, Méthode Nouvelle de la Mécanique Céleste, where you can find this 10 times, 15 times. OK, so uh, he used that for. Uh, you see, he resulted that in the same series continue. Oh, that's something else. Okay. 
OK, so you want to use this to prove that you have a closed geodesic, simple geodesic, on any convex surface. So his idea is, well, OK, I'm going to solve it for one example. And then I take a path from this example to, the, to any convex surface. And I try to follow the key periodic geodesics that I know on the example, I follow them. Maybe some of them will disappear in this motion, but they, they will disappear two by two. Or they will appear two by two, so that the total parity will be constant. And so you need an example for which you understand everything. And then you need this, uh, this uh, continuity principle. For some reason, again, as I told you, uh, uh, the main mistake, is it a mistake? I don't know, because Poincaré knew, of course, as I told you, he knew this problem of properness. He knew that maybe one curve could go to infinity, but he seems he does not discuss that. I don't know. Anyway, uh, uh, one of the problems that he has to explain is that if you start with a simple closed geodesic and you follow it in this process, in the process you will not create intersection points. And that's uh, quite obvious if you have a a geodesic which is closed and simple, how can it create double points? No, it's not possible. That's the proof of Poincaré. Hmm? Anyway, so uh, uh, the proof uh, 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 of Poincaré is, uh, I would say, is complete with one problem that maybe one of these curves could go to infinity. And then I have to admit that uh, this has been, uh, 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 this has been, uh, I will show you that in a moment. This is a theorem today, which has been proved by Calabi and Cao, finding an a priori upper bound for the length of a simple closed geodesic on a convex surface. So they have a paper that I must admit I read. I did not, I understood it line by line, but I'm totally unable to give you a hint of why this is true. Uh, I should read it again, and maybe some geometry in the audience can help me. Uh, 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 there isn't, if you give me a uh, 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 convex surface, Calabi and Cao, they provide an explicit upper bound, depending on the maximum curvature and minimum curvature of the surface, uh, an explicit upper bound for the length of a periodic uh, geodesic on this convex surface. And this is exactly what you need to show that there is no asymp vertical asymptote. So the theorem is OK. If you use this a priori, a priori bound by uh, uh, Calabi and Cao, what you do need is some initial example in which you know that there is an odd number of solutions. And then the situation is quite interesting. As I told you, Poincaré is interested by celestial mechanics. He only thinks about celestial mechanics. And uh, this is a, a, a slide that you have seen yesterday. Uh, and you see that in the three-body problem, there's a parameter mu. And this parameter mu is the mass of the small planet, Jupiter, as respect to the planet, uh, uh, planet uh, of, the, of the sun. So it's a small parameter. And so uh, in the head of Poincaré, he's thinking of this problem as a problem depending on the parameter mu. And when mu is equal to 0, that means that Jupiter is not there. The mass is 0. And when the mass is zero, well, you have the classical Kepler problem for which you know all the solutions. So there is a long paragraph, very, very long paragraph, in this paper of Poincaré on geodesic, in which he starts by saying, OK, for the sphere, the round sphere, we know that all geodesics are closed, periodic. Of course, they are equators. And then he says, what's happening if we deform a little bit 
the sphere to a geoid, to a, uh, a spheroid. He calls that spheroid. A spheroid is a, is a slight perturbation of the sphere. So you introduce a small parameter, and then you prove using techniques from celestial mechanics that when you make the small deformation of the Earth by to, to transform, for, to go from the sphere to the spheroid, well, you prove that uh, there is a f an odd number of periodic simple geodesics. And his proof is using algebraic topology, I would say today Morse theory, and uh, uh, this is a complete proof, but useless in this context. Because in his, in his paper, he says, look, par exemple, pour un ellipsoid, nous avons trois geodésiques fermés. So he had this example of a simple example with ellipsoid with three periodic geodesics. He knew that already, because all geometers knew that at the time. He knew that there are three closed simple geodesics on the ellipsoid, the three sections, the three planes of symmetry. He knew that. But the example is too simple for him, because this example is specific to the geometry of convex sets, and he is not interested by that. He is interested by closed orbit for the mechanical celestial mechanics. So this is why, in this paper, in his paper, for some strange reason, there are at least maybe 30 pages which are useless for the for the purpose of the of the paper. He should have said, "Let me take an ellipsoid." That would have been much easier for him, but that would not have explained his real motivation. What? Ah, you have to show that uh, the, the, there are three solutions and they are transversal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, 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 okay. Well, this is Poincaré. Uh, you don't have to ask too many questions. Huh? <laughs> okay, so I said to myself it might be a good opportunity to tell you about the geodesics on the ellipsoids. Because geodesics on the ellipsoids is like of the, one of the marvels uh, 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 in differential geometry. And I want to explain to you this wonderful chapter of differential geometry, who, which began by a paper of Monge, and then by a paper of Jacobi. Before that, I want to show you this, so this picture. This picture has been drawn by Monge. And this is the picture of the lines of curvature of an ellipsoid projected on, on the plane. So let me, I wanted to say, I am in IMPA, I'm discussing geometry. It would be a shame not to mention Manfredo do Carmo. Manfredo was a great geometer, very influential here. Uh, he was a great lecturer, uh, a, a great mathematician. You have this picture in 68 or something, and you can see him lecturing in Helsinki in 78. Did I? Uh, Manf uh, sorry, sorry, Manfredo do Carmo. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. So, uh, uh, his book, uh, where is the book? His book has, is really fantastic. Uh, most of you know, know it uh, either in Portuguese or in, in, in English. Uh, he offered me a copy in Portuguese. 40 years ago, and I still keep it with a, a good memory of that. OK, so look at this picture. This is an ellipsoid with three different axes. And the curves that you see here in green and blue are the lines of curvatures. And how do you draw this picture? I want to show you that. This is the theorem of Monge. Monge proved the following theorem. If you have three families of surfaces which intersect two by two in a perpendicular way, 
the intersections of any one of the surfaces by the two others are the lines of curvature of the surface. So this uh, 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 is a wonderful topic which has been developed a lot later by, for example, Darbou wrote a book on triple orthogonal systems. Let me show you uh, one example. You take the ellipsoid whose equation is there. It's an ellipsoid in three space. And it depends on one parameter lambda. So for each value lambda, A, B, C are given. For each value lambda, you have an ellipsoid. And when lambda goes from minus infinity to plus infinity, you have a family of ellipsoids, or sorry, of quadrics. Depending on the position of lambda uh, with respect to A, B, C, the corresponding quadric might be an ellipsoid, a hyperboloid with one sheet, or hyperboloid with two sheets. And the theorem is that through every point in space, x, y, z, three of these Fami three members of this family are, are, are passing through any, any point in the, in, in the space. It's better to see on, on the movie, you will see that. So you can see here, lambda is moving, and you have the first family of hyperboloids with two sheets in red. Now lambda will move again from uh, A to B or something, in blue, if my memory is correct, and you will see the second family of quadrics, hyperboloids with one sheet. And you will see in a moment that the blue is indeed perpendicular to the red. And then lambda is moving again in the third interval, and now we'll describe the third family of quadrics, which will be ellipsoids. As you can see, everything is perpendicular, and you have these three families of quadrics intersecting along the lines of curvatures of the ellipsoid. So you can see the limiting position, and at the end of the movie, you will see the lines of curvature of the uh, uh, ellipsoid that I showed you already. OK, so this is the picture of Monge. Hmm? Monge proved that what you see here are indeed the lines of curvature on the ellipsoids. And the points, the four points that you can see, these lines going out of the pictures, are called the, are called the uh, umbilical points of the ellipsoids. OK. So we understand the geometry of the uh, uh, line of curvature on the ellipsoid. Now let me tell you about the geodesics. So this is from Monge, now I'm going to Jacobi. Jac yes, I'll tell you. Yeah, yeah. This, I can give it to you after the talk. This is a Yes, but Monge maybe did not get this movie. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I give you the reference. Yeah, yeah. Dupin, Dup, of course, Dupin was the beloved student of Monge. And he, uh, he, he, he proved it for general situation of triple orthogonal systems, not for this specific example. OK. Now let's, let me discuss geodesics. So let me draw a picture. You have the ellipsoid. <laughs> and let's take one of the hyperboloids, let's say with one sheet, which is perpendicular to this one, something like that.
Now you can imagine that this is kind of a chimney. And now play the following game. You walk on the ellipsoid, and you see in your horizon, the horizon is uh, the tangent plane to the ellipsoid. It intersects the chimney on the, on the conic. And your goal is to walk in such a way that you always aim in a direction with it which is tangent to the chimney. So you walk, you, you see, you are on the, on the ellipsoid. You see very far away a chimney. And you travel on the ellipsoid with only one condition. You always walk tangentially in the direction which is tangent to the ellipsoid, to the, to the hyperboloid, to the chimney. And the theorem of, of uh, 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 Jacobi is that if you do that, walking always tangent to the chimney, you will travel along the geodesic. So here's a picture. You can see here in blue a geodesic. And you can see that this geodesic is aiming at the chimney, arriving tangentially to the chimney. And as soon as you pass the chimney, you aim again at the, at the chimney on the other side, and you will oscillate between the two, between the you will oscillate in this ring on the, uh, on the ellipsoid. So geodesics are just quasi-periodic, and they travel like in a irrational torus. Uh, they, 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 they travel quasi-periodically between these chimneys. The proof is easy. What? Yeah, it could be periodic or non-periodic, depending on the chimney that you chose. The chimney is associated to parameter lambda. And when lambda moves in the, in the interval, the rotation number is moving. Sometimes it's rational, and then you have periodic trajectory. Sometimes irrational, and then you have a, uh, quasi-periodic. So let me uh, prove the theorem of, of Jacobi. Why traveling always in the direction tangent to, uh, uh, to the chimney uh, uh, forces you to follow uh, a geodesic? And the proof is this. So you have this curve, let's say x at the time t, and by, by, by definition, by definition, your direction is tangent to the, to the hyperboloid, to the chimney. You have a point yt. So look at the vector xt, yt. This is the vector which is tangent to, to your curve. And let's look at the derivative in time of this vector. What's happening to this vector? Well, yt is tangent to the hyperboloid. Uh, xt is tangent to the ellipsoid. So the derivative of this is a vector which is, at the same time, tangent, which is a, a derivative of a vector which is, uh, is, in the, I'm sorry, is in the intersection of the tangent plane. Uh, sorry. The derivative of this vector belongs to the tangent plane to the hyperboloid at yt. But by, I told you it's perpendicular to the, to, the hyperbo to the ellipsoid. So the result is that if you play this game of always aiming at the chimney, you know that your acceleration, derivative of velocity, is perpendicular to the tangent plane. This is the definition of geodesic. A geodesic is nothing more than a curve whose acceleration is perpendicular at each moment to the surface. So the theorem of, 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 of Jacobi is, is, is obvious. So here's a few pictures. I showed you one family of geodesics. Here's another family. And this is a third family. And this is a fourth family. Now you see that the chimney is oriented in the 
in the other direction when you uh, aim at a two-sheeted family of a, a, a hyperboloid with two-sheeted family. And you have these pictures. And finally, you have uh, this picture of the, what's happening when you start from an umbilical point. And then there's a very spe specific case. If you start from an umbilical point, you, have, uh, you are in a stable manifold of, of, of a periodic geodesic. The geodesic is asymptotic to one of the closed geodesics uh, that you obtain by slicing with a plane. So I wanted to show you that because it's amazing. Of course, Poincaré knew that. And he, he even mentions that. I mean, he says, look, you could have started with a, with a high ellipsoid. He knew that, but only half a line. I mean, he knew that it was part of the standard culture in mathematical uh, community at the time. Uh, I'm not sure many of you uh, knew that, but uh, it's a beautiful picture anyway. OK, so uh, this is the reference for the paper of, uh, uh, of Calabi and Cao, proving an, uh, an a priori upper bound for the length of a geodesic uh, uh, on a given convex surface. And then I want to go to the last part of the paper of Poincaré. Another proof. Well, the first was not quite a proof. And the second is even less a proof. The second proof is this. And look what he's writing. We have seen that there is always at least one closed geodesics with no double point. Although this proof ne laisse rien à désirer, au point de vue de sa simplicité, I believe it might be useful to give another one even though it is much less uh, simple. So I will present this second proof that I think nobody understands, uh, uh, um, which might be a good project for a student to, to uh, renew it. So here's the, the, the idea. Uh, the idea is this. If you take a geodesic closed geodesic uh, on, on a convex sphere. And if you use the Gauss-Bonnet theorem to each one of the two hemispheres, you see that the integral of curvature by Gauss-Bonnet theorem, the integral of curvature on each half of the, of the sphere is equal to 2 pi. So his idea is this. Let us consider all curves on the surface, on, this, on the sphere all simple curves which divide the surface in two parts, each one having half of the curvature. So you look at the space of simple closed curves on the sphere, which are such that each of the two connected components of the complement have an integral of curvature equal to 2 pi. And you know that if you look for a simple closed geodesic, it has to be like that. And you look at the space of those curves, and the observation of, uh, of Poincaré is that uh, the length of such a curve cannot be small. Because if you take a curve which is too small, it will uh, uh, bound a domain which is very small, so that the uh, total uh, curvature in this domain may be too small. So we know that the space of curves with this property that half, each half has half of the curvature uh, has a lower bound for its length. And then Poincaré says, let's minimize the length of curves among this space of curves. And he says, parmi ces courbes, one of them is shorter than all of the others. I claim that this one is a geodesic. OK, then he proves that this minimum is a geodesic. And after the proof, he says, well, let's have a look at our proof, and let's, let us check if the proof is correct or not. 
And then he says, well, no, 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 ex let's examine the objections that one might uh, have against this incomplete proof. I love this concept, incomplete proofs. And, <laughs> and he says, uh, uh, one could uh, first of all ask, is there a minimum? Is there a curve with minimum length among uh, 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 those? And the second is, is this minimum achieved on a simple closed curves, which is say, infinity or analytic or whatever? And then he begins uh, splitting the questions in two. And he says, uh, uh, the first question of the existence of minimum is coming from analysis. It is the kind of question that we find in all problems uh, um, he has in mind, uh, like uh, uh, finding harmonic functions and the Dirichlet problem, etc., etc. He's very well aware of the difficulties. We are in 1905. The problem of the existence of harmonic functions has been solved by Hilbert in 1900. So Hilbert has proved the existence uh, of harmonic function with a given boundary value on the disk. So uh, he says, je me bornerai à renvoyer aux travaux de Hilbert. So he is right. I mean, at this level, proving that uh, there is a curve with minimum length satisfying this property is, is OK. But the second problem that he mentions is much more serious. Maybe, maybe, the limiting curve with a minimum length might produce things which could be very strange. Something like that, for example. Who knows? The curve with minimum length, the limiting could be something like that. You see, you could have, if you go to the minimum, you could have a, and if you go to a shorter one, And who knows, maybe you have uh, this kind of picture. That when you go to the minimum, some parts of the curve might join and stick one to the other. And then he says, I don't know. Maybe this happens. And he says, I have no proof that this does not happen. And he suggests physics to prove that this does not happen. So he has a very uh, clever uh, uh, idea of constructing a thought experiment. He says, let's imagine that we have our, our, our convex set. It's uh, made out of uh, some solid matter. And you build another layer, very thin layer, on top of the convex set, whose height is exactly equal to epsilon times the curvature. So it's a layer which is not, uh, uh, even, whose width, whose height is not constant. The height is, um, is uh, 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 depending on curvature, is proportional to curvature. So you have this, uh, this convex set and you have a, a second layer. In between these two parallel, or almost parallel things, you put some gas air at some high pressure. And then you imagine that this curve, instead of being a curve on the surface, you build a, 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 a wall above it to separate the gas in two distinct parts. So this thin band is subject to pressure the pressure of the gas from both sides. And he says, uh, 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 OK, so let's look at the motion of the band. And the band will move and will go to geodesic. And then he looks at this question. Is that possible that in the motion, some parts of the, of the band might stick to each other or not? And then using physical arguments, he claims that this is not possible. He gives some insight, physical insight, 
that this is uh, not possible, and that's the end of the poof. Uh, I think this is remarkable. You have to, to know that Poincaré, even though he was a mathematician, also a mathematical physicist, he never taught mathematics at the university. He was professor at the Sorbonne, but he was never in charge of teaching mathematics. He was always teaching physics, or astronomy, or capillarity, or mechanism, or gears. But he was not teaching mathematics. Uh, to give you an example, if you look at the, uh, what he uh, wrote during the year 1882, when he was uh, creating Fuchsian groups, you know, automorphic forms, etc., etc. At the same moment, he was teaching at the University of Sorbonne a course called Mechanisms. And the book, uh, the book is full of pictures of gears and uh, uh, all these uh, pulley, uh, very, very, very concrete objects. So you have to have in mind that Poincaré was also a physicist, at least theoretical physics. And uh, here he is uh, imagining an object completely strange with this elastic band moving under the pressure of a gas. And that's a proof of, uh, of the fact that uh, uh, there is a closed geodesic. I be to be frankly speaking, I do not understand the physical argument at the, at the end of the paper. Uh, I, would, I would love to understand what he has in mind. Anyway, much later uh, in uh, 82, uh, Christopher Croke uh, took again this problem. And uh, at the end of the, at the beginning of the paper, he's very nasty. He says, uh, Poincaré is wrong. OK, he's wrong. And uh, uh, he wants to fix the proof of uh, Poincaré. But he says, I want to do something completely different. So no gas, no band, no, no physics, no thought experiment only Sobolev spaces and uh, things like that. And it does prove that, indeed, the minimum is achieved on a curve which is embedded and which is a geodesic. Uh, this paper is not easy to read, well, at least for me. OK, now I told you that I described the second part of the paper of Poincaré when he tries to find closed, simple closed geodesics on, on the convex here. But there's a first part. And the first part is, um, uh, is not dynamics. It's about uh, cut locus, conjugate points, what's happening on positive curvature for geodesics. And he even creates beautiful terminology. For example, instead of cut locus, he says, ligne de partage. But I think it's a beautiful, uh, uh, beautiful choice of terminology. And then I want to show you and to uh, explain a sleeping problem. This is a problem that I tried to solve a long time ago. And uh, 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 I could not solve it. And, uh, you know, my, my, my Siri just told me, je n'ai pas compris. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> OK. Amazing, huh? Anyway, so uh, here's the sleeping problem that comes from the ligne de partage and actually comes from uh, Jacobi and Arnold. The question is about the conjugate points on an ellipsoid. So here's a, a quote from Arnold. At the end of his lecture on these caustics, Jacobi remarked that for the simplest perturbation of the sphere, making it an ellipsoid, the number of cusps is four. He even stated that in the case of an ellipsoid, a caustic has always four cusps, 
I do not know whether this Jacobi statement is true or not. It is a challenge both for the algebraic geometry and for the scientific computing. However, this real problem is too difficult for the algebraic geometers. <laughs> and thus, the last geometric th Jacobi statement is rather a conjecture than a theorem. It is known that the first caustic has at least four cusps for a convex surface. So let me explain what is the conjecture of, Jac of Jacobi according to Arnold. And let, let me show you some pictures suggesting that maybe uh, Jacobi is right. The problem is that uh, I looked at the reference given by Arnold in Jacobi, and I did not find it in Jacobi. But OK, let's believe Arnold. So here's the paper that appeared rather recently in Experimental Mathematics, this uh, wonderful uh, uh, journal accepting papers with no proof. I'm sure that uh, Poincaré would have loved it. I, I even accept paper, wrong papers, maybe, I don't know. Uh, uh, this is a paper showing pictures. So uh, let me remind you quickly uh, what is the uh, conjugate locus. So you take a convex surface, for example, or even an ellipsoid, I take a point in this ellipsoid and take the tangent plane at this point. Then you have the exponential map sending the tangent plane of the ellipsoid to the, to the convex set. Of course, this cannot be diffeomorphism because this is a plane and this is a sphere. And uh, using standard <laughs> estimates uh, 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 in Riemannian geometry, one can prove the following. There are concentric curves such that the Jacobian of the exponential is singular, is zero, along these curves. So the exponential map is a diffeomorphism, is local diffeomorphism on this disk, has, a sing, uh, has zero Jacobian here, then has a non-zero Jacobian here, then zero Jacobian on the, uh, on the next curve, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And when you look at the image of this curve by the exponential map, you see typically something like that. So let me show a picture for the first one. This is a picture for the first conjugate uh, locus of a point. You have the point A and you send geodesics by the exponential map from the point A, which is in the, from in the back of the picture. And these geodesics uh, uh, are tangent to this curve. And the assertion of Jacobi is that in the case of an ellipsoid, this curve has four singular points, four cusps. Even today, nobody has proved it. There is a, a quotation by uh, uh, Marcel Berger saying that this is a shame. I mean, everything is known. I mean, the geodesic flow, I told you, is completely explicit. We know the formula. We have uh, elliptic functions, hyperelliptic functions. We can describe by formula the exponential map. And the theorem says that there are four points on which uh, you have a curse, which means, in terms of this circle here, that the distance from the origin to this circle has two maximum and two minimum, something like that. 
has two maximum and two minimum. The man maximum and minimum are sent to the singular point. So that's the conjecture of Jacobi. And according to Arnold, but once again, I did not find that in the paper of Jacobi, Jacobi went further. He said, let us look at the images of the successive curves here, and you get a sequence of uh, conjugate locuses, loci. And let me show you some pictures from this uh, experimental paper. You have seen this kind of picture. So you have in white, black, and gray, we have the images of the first, second, and third caustics. The first in black, the second in gray, and the third in white are the images of the first, second, and third uh, caustics. And you can see that these curves become more and more complicated, but always they have four cusps and no more. And so far, nobody could prove it. it. I'm, some, I'm kind of frustrated because uh, uh, this, paper, this paper in experimental pa uh, mathematics has been published rather recently, a long time ago with my colleague Bruno Sevenek. We spent a lot of time on the computer drawing pictures which are much more beautiful than this. And uh, we reached the same conclusion not only the first, second, and third. We did a lot of, compute, of com computations on many ellipsoids, and always four. The nth conjugate point on any ellipsoid seems to have four uh, 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 cusps. And finally, uh, Arnold makes a comment. This is Arnold's comment. He says that conjecturally, if, if a convex surface is not an ellipsoid, the number of cusps goes to infinity when you go to the nth uh, uh, caustic curve. And so the, the minimality of this four would be restricted to the algebraicity of, of, the, of, the, of the ellipsoid. Okay, Opa. thank you very much. <laughs>